Welcome back to the main event of this episode, everybody. And the best way to put this is not one of the normal gimmicks that we usually do. This is just essentially, let's shit talk TNA for a while. <laughs> Uh, the big hot tag that happened this week that we didn't want to just keep on the hot tags is TNA has uh, sort of officially been fucked. Uh, they are not going to be renewed on Spike TV, and they are going to have to shop around and see if they can get on any other kind of a network. And boy, do they not have any bargaining chips in their corner. So, in memoriam for the future demise of TNA, and uh, who knows if that uh, will end up coming the way that we predicted in episode 85 before or not, but we are going to start discussing the beginning of the end of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, and we're going to throw some different things out there uh, that are similar to different gimmick stipulations that we've done in the past on Smack Talk, and the first of which is sort of a belt or berry. And it's TV deal or no TV deal. Should TNA go somewhere else? Should somebody else pick up TNA? Or should we just let them be canceled and be done with it? I'm not going to elaborate too much on this because I don't think I necessarily need to. But no, they should not get any kind of a TV deal. Nobody should pick them up because (laughs) there is no chance whatsoever that they will ever get better. And be worth any contract whatsoever. Wago, what do you think? No. If there's any justice in this world, hell no. They have had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and they have squandered it all. They had Panda Energy backing them, giving them a shit ton of money, which they've pissed away. They've got to be 10 million in the hole. Fucking. They had Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Jeff Hardy, Kurt Angle. Bunch of other Fish WWE off. guys. Sting. They, Sting. Fucking Sting. The one guy that WWE could not get. And they fucked up. It, they, it wasn't... They had name power. They had money. They had two hours of primetime television. And they fucked up. If there is any justice in this world, no one will pick them up. They don't deserve it. They pissed it away. Fuck you, Dixie. Miguel, should they get a TV deal from somewhere else? And if uh, if so, where would you like to see them pop up? Or if not, then rip them a new asshole. <laughs> Let me just start off by saying I'm going to give them some credit. Because when you consider where they started out when they got to Spike, they started out in a death spot. They were doing Saturday nights for one hour. And they built up their fan base. They were able to get to primetime, middle of the week. And for a while, they were a credible number two, it seems. I would say 2007 to 2009 were probably their strongest years. You know, They had just signed Kurt Angle. They were starting to push Samoa Joe as a big deal. You started to see guys like Kevin Nash, Scott Steiner, Booker T. A lot of these guys pop up on there. It seemed like they were going to be a big deal. And then Hogan came along, and it seemed like everything just ended. I think Hogan being there was... I can't even say there was any real good to it because there, there was too much bad. They really sunk their credibility down the hole. They sunk a lot of money down. Even with guys like Jeff Hardy, Mr. Anderson, RVD, they just proved how inept and how they just weren't ready for the business. And I got to agree with you guys. I, I don't think that they really do. It's hard for me to say because I don't want the guys that are working for TNA to go out of business. I don't want them to be left to to squander on the indies i mean say what you want it still is a mainstream primetime slot that these guys are working on uh i i agree with you i don't think that they deserve that from a business perspective they deserve to continue but gun to my head if i had to choose whether what channel that i could see them getting picked up on I guess you can maybe say CMT. I, they they have a big Southern following, especially with their affiliation with the Jarrett's and and Hogan. Um, after that, maybe if they sweeten the the cards or the sweeten the pot, they could probably get some like deal with them. Other than that, I can't see anything else. I don't think they'll get picked up by any sort of like syndication deal. They're not going to get picked up by a major network or even a cable network. It's the end of the road for them, and you know what? I'll give them. I'll give them a golf clap for lasting as long as they did. Because I mean, we've been talking about their death for like years. I mean, I remember people in 2010 saying that, "Oh, this is going to be it. They're not going to last another year." 
And and they've lasted pretty far. So, you know, they get a golf clap. And that's about it for me. Drew, should they get another TV deal from somebody else or fuck them? Fuck them! Because I don't give a rat's ass. You know what? One of the first episodes I was on was when we were like the whole episode 85 thing. This would have been so amazing if this happened last year on episode 85. This would have been the greatest thing that ever happened. We would be Jesus on ice, but we're not Jesus on ice where you're late. But I don't think they should get a TV deal, mainly because they've I've had no appeal of them in the past. They still have no appeal to me. And I used to be just a general wrestling fan. If I can't, if they don't have any appeal to me, then, you know, fuck it. Why? No. Just get out of my face. TNA. TNA sucks. I wrote Ring of Honor. <laughs> Peyton, any chance of trying to defend them here, or is the same kind of statements echoed? Yeah, you're in the wrong neighborhood if you're looking for a defense for TNA. Uh, let this company just die. I, they've, as Wago has pointed out, every single opportunity they've had, they've maybe taken advantage of 10% of the potential that they could have through all that. This company just needs to go. They're, they're a black mark on the history of professional wrestling, especially present day. They're doing nothing but holding lots of other talented people back from either working for a better company or doing something else more productive with their lives. Everyone who was ever involved with TNA just span their wheels for whatever amount of time they were with them. No one got better. It, it's just a complete waste. So kudos to them for making it past episode 85. That's all well and good. Just let it end. Let it end. That'd be funny if that was something that was passed around for morale. They're like, we made it past Smart Out Moments episode 85. <laughs> a couple people backstage are like, woo. <laughs> By the way, you're not going to get paid this week. Uh, oh. so, <laughs> so sticking with you, Peyton, we're going to kind of go in reverse mode here. Uh, we were talking about beforehand trying to do maybe a list of like a top rope list sort of of the biggest mistakes that TNA made. Uh, what do you think were some of the biggest mistakes? Well, Number one is not taking full advantage of AJ Styles. That was your franchise player. That was the guy that became a star in your company. Everyone liked him pretty much as far as their fan base. From what I understand, he was pretty well liked backstage, put on excellent matches. There's no reason this guy couldn't have been your number one guy. And yet, once they start bringing in all these ex-WWE guys... AJ Styles was pretty much all but forgotten. You never really saw him during those last number of years. And, of course, he jumps ship, goes to Japan, goes back to Ring of Honor, and he's a giant star again. He's a world champion. He's got this whole stable booked around him, and he's happier than he's ever been. So good for AJ. Sucks for TNA. Number two, constantly defending Vince Russo. Dixie Carter was the most guilty of this, but the whole company would always come to bat for Vince Russo whenever he was called out. The guy has great ideas once in a while, but he needs somebody to tell him when he has a stupid fucking idea, not just bring it to TV. And that never happened in the latter days of WCW, and it didn't happen in all the time he was there in TNA. So that was a huge mistake. And for me, my top mistake for them was the shift to Monday nights to try to compete with WWE. What a fucking boneheaded idea. Who in their right mind thought that was ever going to work for that company? They went and did that. But after that, it just dropped down to the most abysmal levels, and the company never recovered. They, they were a complete laughing stock from that point up until now. So it's very hard for me to not look at that as the biggest single blunder that they've ever done. So, Drew, what do you think were some of the biggest mistakes that they made? You know, uh, I think Mike had nailed all of them in the head with the coffin. But uh, the one mistake, the biggest mistake they've ever had, and I will get a list one because there's only one rope for me on this one. They fucking existed. That was their issue. <laughs> their biggest mistake was not having been dead before they existed. <laughs> yes. Miguel, what do you think? Some of the biggest mistakes that TNA's ever made. Honestly, one of the biggest mistakes I could think of, and I can't really fault them for taking this risk, but it goes back to Hogan. I mean, Hogan really did a lot of damage in the long run to them. He was a big, expensive signing that they couldn't afford. 
that didn't go out and promote them that the way he should have, that really did run roughshod in terms of a lot of the main ideas, had a lot more control backstage than he really should have. I, I, he, he brought down morale. I'll admit he did. He probably kept them going at a time when probably Spike TV would have gotten rid of them. I think to, to a lot of the older men that run Spike TV, he probably is still a name. But I had a lot of high hopes for when he came in, when him and Bischoff came in. And within the first six months, I knew something was bad. And I think within a year, everybody realized that this this was a mistake. I, I really do think that a lot of their problems happened when Hogan came along. Um, aside from that, I would say always compromising their identity because there were a lot of periods early on where they seemed like they had stuff that they that WWE didn't. You know, you know when Scott D'Amore was running the the uh, Knockouts division, there were times where the Knockouts were drawing were putting quarter hour numbers up that were you know rivaling the the main event guys. When you when they started the X division, there was a big focus on that. I mean, guys like Joe and AJ came from there. It seemed like everything that they had that they were doing right that made them that got them a name, they just got rid of. They never really knew how to keep it going, and I think that was probably one of their biggest mistakes. Um, other than that, yeah, Russo. That's really the 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 other big, the third big one on my list because, I mean, everybody says has been saying negative stuff about this guy, but. Dixie just didn't know what to do with it. I can't even say Jeff was any better because he was the one that brought him on. They're both besties. Uh, even Hogan. I thought Hogan, his first time when he came in, was going to be to get rid of Russo, but he kept him on for a little while, and I, I never understood that. So, yeah, I, I those are my three big na- uh, th- uh, problems with the way TNA was managed. And, Wago, any other ones that stick out to you as potential biggest mistakes in the company? The biggest mistake this company had, by far, over everything else that they did wrong, was product awareness. People would ask Kurt Angle, Jeff Hardy, Rob Van Dam, Hey, when are you going to start wrestling again? They've been wrestling for five fucking years. No one fucking knows because TNA doesn't promote their shit. People think that um, people are just disinterested in the product and that's why they're having such shitty numbers. No, no one knows they've got a show there. I think it even happened to Peyton once that they was running a show or in his area that he didn't know about just because they don't promote sh- uh, jack shit. That's their biggest issue. If people know that you've got a show on, then they'll go to it. There's no reason that House of Hardcore can draw the numbers they do and TNA can't get a fucking tenth of that. It's ridiculous. So product awareness is their biggest issue and it's always has, has been their issue. It's a, pro- it's a professional wrestling promotion. Promote it. Um... Fucking the booking is the second part. And last rights match, Black Rain, Claire Lynch, the fuck. (laughs) And if I had to go with any, if I had to pick a third topic, scraping the bottom of the barrel, I think they've um, lost a lot of loyalty with their fan base. There were TNA diehards that would defend it to no end before. And they don't have that connection, they don't have that loyalty, and they don't have, um, they've lost all that with them. Be it from treating particular workers like shit, not paying them, uh, like AJ Styles, who jumped shit. Uh, Gail Kim was, they had, they did that to Gail Kim a long time ago, I know she's back with the company now, but that rustled a few feathers. They've always had a history of just, um, treating their talent like crap and bringing them backwards and forwards and... Not paying them the money they deserve to be paid. It's ridiculous. Um, a perfect example of them not using talent right was Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle. You bring Kurt Angle in for the first time and you have him squash, who was arguably their biggest name at the time, with Samoa Joe with the run that he was on. They just don't know how to handle their talent. It's ridiculous. Some other things that I was thinking of when uh, I was trying to think of some really bad mistakes. Botches. And they talk about all the time whenever they're it's trying to do an interview and somebody says like, oh, well, what's preventing you from being on the level of WWE? And they always go, well, we already are. We're actually better than WWE. And they say the exact same thing every time. We've got the best wrestlers in the world, the hardest working guys or whatever. Yeah, you also have the most amount of time dedicated to you in Botchamania. And I can't watch a single pay-per-view and not 
sit there and just go, that was botch, that was a botch, that was really a botch. Oh, crap, that was a botch of a booking mistake. So many different things that were just flat-out mistakes, as simple as that is. And that goes for failed promises, too. How many times does WWE put out something as being the biggest thing in the world, and it's not at least something interesting? Now, we have one... Uh, example from last week of a hype thing that actually turned out to be stupid and that's that WWE transformed which turned out to just be an article on WWE.com where they were like oh well what if we redid some of the costume design for some people alright well you know what they also didn't promote that all over the place it was one tweet uh, TNA has this mentality of something's going to happen on impact this week that changes the world of professional wrestling forever. And what is it? We changed the color of the strap of one of our titles. Oh crap. We're like, we hired somebody who is a future, a uh, former champion in WWE and a multi-level star and whatever. And it's fucking Shannon Moore or something. And those kind of botches are unforgivable after a while. You wouldn't watch a TV show with bad acting and you wouldn't watch a movie with horrible special effects unless you wanted to make fun of this kind of stuff. And it's so much easier to make fun of TNA than it is to be proud of it. Can I can I dovetail another issue that I had with them off of off of something you mentioned? Certainly. The blatant copying. Yes. That is something that infuriated me about TNA because I can understand maybe using a gimmick from the past and maybe modernizing it or kind of, you know, using a similar idea to your competition. But there were times where they would just go all out and just be like, I am shamelessly copying the competition because, you know, whether it's Eric Young getting his push with the big beard which was clearly done to, to capitalize on uh, Daniel Bryan's thing. Uh, I can't really say Austin Aries' run capitalized on CM Punk's thing, even though that happened at the same time. To me, the biggest example of it was when they brought back Sting back in, I think, 2012, and they did that awful 3-31-11 thing when he came back. It was to play off of the 2-21-11 thing that they had on uh, WWE when people thought Sting was coming to the WWE. That was just so Bush League that that really infuriated me. And I'm sure if we all thought hard enough, we could think of other examples. But DNA just came off at so many times as just being so low rent with just really blatant gimmicks that just were nothing more than just, hey, I'm either copying WWE or I'm doing something to capitalize on something new. And, And yeah, WWE does this. Did you, uh, is guilty of this, but not to the level of TNA. They were just shameless. Well, another good example of that, WWE decides to bring in the ECW people. They do One Night Stand. What does TNA do? Hardcore Justice, where they have to refer to them as EV 2.0. And you get these people, like, uh, they make a big deal out of PJ Polacco. And it's like, yeah, all right, well, the only reason that anybody gave a shit about One Night Stand is because you had the people like fucking dreamer and rvd and sabu and sandman and you know the guys that actually as much as they weren't the best guys in the world the people that ecw fans remembered the most (laughs) and they did that shit all the time i mean even when it comes to their songs they're just the exact same copies as they possibly can of normal songs and wwe songs yeah I mean, it's a one thing if you're going to say, like, WCW did that, because, yeah, WCW was notorious for that, too, but that was back in the days when that was a novelty. You know, you didn't hear modern music used in de- wrestler themes, and, w- and you know, WCW had the, the pull that they could pull that off. TNA just seems like they're blatantly copying, and it's just – I. Like I said, it's just it's it's copying. It's not homage. It's not recycling an old gimmick. You know, you're copying, and it just it goes back to the whole d- TNA not no- having an identity of their own. You know, they, people call them WWE light, and they're not wrong. Another is, mistake that I think, and what were you gonna say, Wego? Oh yeah, and I love how they tried to hype up them having their own big MMA star, fucking King Mo. <laughs> 
Yes. Let me ask you, Tony, did you ever hear a King Mo? Nope. Drew, did you ever hear a King Mo? Dude, I don't even know what TNA is. Isn't Mo that guy who was with Mabel? (laughs) Isn't Mo that chick from Guts? Oh, wow. Wow, I was actually going to give you the the, the award for... uh, Random, um, r- r- um, for random bit of um, nostalgia, but man, Tony, I think beat you, Payton. What's funny yeah. is that's the second time that Mo has been mentioned from Guts on yes, <laughs> Families a- Anonymous <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yeah, fucking the King Mo and all the Bellator MMA stuff was fucking retarded. Although, to be fair, though, that was a mandate from Viacom. That was them going, look, we're funneling money to you. You're going to help us promote our new investment. Yeah, they, yeah, they didn't have to deal. integrate them into storylines that heavily or that retarded. They had a pull of how they used them. Fair enough. They spend money on the people like the Tito Ortiz people or even the people like Snooki. I mean, WWE does that every once in a while. They bring in those guest stars and stuff and try to get some attention from the mainstream media. But you know what? WWE does that because, number one, they have the money that they can do that. And number two, because they get that attention from mainstream media and they know how to capitalize on that. Well, that that's the thing is that TNA couldn't even get Snooki. They got all the other characters from the Jersey Shore, but even Snooki wasn't even low enough that she would work for TNA. And they do different kind of crossover stuff like that. And they you know make a big deal out of it, just the same as they do with everything. And if you don't have the income to pass around, then don't do it you don't pay for more things that you can't afford i mean it takes money to make money and you do have to pay to make money when you are talking about big numbers and everything but you can't spend all your money and not get some kind of profit in return and there's no point in having guest stars come out to the impact zone which is another thing that people are criticism uh critical of you give away free tickets. How are you going to earn anything? You really think that's going to bump up the ratings from an 0.8 to a 4.0? No, it isn't. The only reason that people end up watching TV shows ever is if enough people talk about it and if it's good enough. TV's I'll... always been guilty of the fucking celebrity thing. Remember when the idiots decided to make fucking um, Adam Pacman Jones a tag team champion? Then realized, oh, legally he's not allowed to wrestle for us, so they had to get another fucking person to replace him. <laughs> Xavier yeah. Woods. Fucking idiots. Yeah, and, and it's, in, as far as the use, uh, them using the impact zone, I'll admit early on I think it was a good idea because it allowed them to have a hot crowd mm-hmm. every every showing. I mean, those those early crowds from the impact zone were not bad. It was towards the end of their run, though, that those crowds started to suck. And by that point, they should have had enough capital that they could have at least gone on the road, which they tried to, and they clearly proved that they just cannot afford that. Oh, they can afford it if they promote their shows so people turn up. You want to hear an interesting story, actually, that that kind of ties into how inept they are as a company? One thing, I, I just want to point out, you said the fans were bad towards the end. They accomplished one thing that was very good. Knock, knock, who's there? Braden Walker. Greatest chant ever. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah it, that actually reminds me of um uh jester when he went to go see um when he went to go to a tna pay-per-view i think it was the one that they had that um that six sides of steel matchup with uh test in it the one that they the one that they botched and couldn't get the walls up he was saying how he tried to start a cena sucks chant or we want cena chant at the pay-per-view <laughs> <laughs> i'm surprised it didn't catch on but yeah <laughs> It's something that goes to the how you know inept they are in promotions. Um, you know how when WWE comes to town, they always have those trucks that have the logos on the on the on the uh, the buses, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well, TNA they don't have that. They just have you know whatever uh, whatever truck they can afford, like whatever U-Haul. So Kaz Frankie Kazarian actually uh, offered to make them decals. He he know he has a friend of his that can make professional decals that would have made some for him. To put on the trucks so that, you know, they would actually have some TNA themed trucks come through, you know, that they could use. And they said no. You know, you had a guy offering to make you free promotional stuff and you turned him down. If it was any other company, they would have leapt, leapt at that. But, you know, TNA is just they wouldn't know a good idea if it bit them. 
As soon as you said about them having production vans, I was just imagining like a white van with TNA written in Sharpie. <laughs> That's no, it's just a regular U-Haul truck, from what I've heard. It's even worse. It's they started writing it in the Sharpie, but they ran out with like halfway through the end. So it's like that real faded A kind of a thing. <laughs> Let me put it this way. The Exotic Express recently drove through a town near me and like a bunch of people blew up knowing about it. TNA has come to my town around here and nobody recalls seeing anything involving them. Not not poster, not, not even like those white things that you always see on telephone poles promoting the, sh- the shows coming up at high schools. Right. None of those. No radio spots, no commercials on TV, nothing. Oh, I, re- I remember when FCW, when I used to live up in Tampa, they would paper a, a, a bunch of places with just like, come see the shows. Like, And that was FCW that mm-hmm. was doing that. OTW it's... does that. The wrestling organization that I'm affiliated with, every time in Williamstown when we were going to have some kind of a show, there's flyers passed around. I mean, we've got the website that's pointing out uh, exactly how to get to the location and everything like that. The, it's not hard at all to do that. And you think if they had any sense whatsoever, maybe at first they thought that they had enough recognition that people would just know and it would just be passed around. Maybe they had the gall to think that. After you start getting pictures online of how you didn't draw more than a couple, you know, dozen people or so to your shows, you got to know that you got to kick your ass into gear. And that's with any company too. I mean, if Smart Out Moment started getting no hits on the website, no followers on the YouTube account, any of that kind of stuff. You got to be sure I'm posting all over the place and going, fucking go to my website, go to my YouTube channel and all that. And that's what they got to do. They tried. There was a period. Uh, I, does anybody remember TNA Academy? Nope. 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 It was an what? initiative they had like in the uh, around 2008, 2009, where they would visit colleges and they would they would they would rally fans together and be like, listen, if, if we're coming to your town, we need you guys to go around and kind of promote the show and paper things around. I remember they had that um, Bill and Doug group. They were kind Ugh. of the spearheaders oh, those of those. Fucking two idiots. Yeah, because I remember they were on the TNA payroll for a little while, and they were the big two front runners for that. And I actually gave them credit for it. I'm like, okay, they're they're going through they're you know they're going through the the college market, which is still a viable market. You know, those guys will go out there for you and and spread the word. You know, they're they're hitting the youngsters, and they just gave up on that. You know, it, it was something that WWE was not doing that they could have gotten the leg up for, and they just kind of just tossed it away. Yeah, I have no idea what this thing is. Or Bill and Doug. Uh, Bill, Bill, and, Bill and Doug were two idiots that decided to be a part of the YouTube shooting bullshit where fans would cut shoot promos about WWE and TNA. And they ended up making a big buzz because they hijacked a WWE press conference with TNA questions. And that's why they got their following. And they had a big following for a while. Hmm. Yeah, they they were big TNA marks. I remember early on, and and then they they actually had like a little podcast for TNA uh, professionally uh, for a little while. Like I said, they were on their payroll. And I think they ended up being part of the Pro Wrestling Report and getting bumped off that too. Oh, yeah. I, I was like watching Pro Wrestling Report regularly back then. They were the laughing stock. Like they would have like a ten minute segment every week on the Pro Wrestling Report, and the chat room would just be like, "Oh, Bill and Ted are here," <laughs> just like spend the whole time <laughs> making fun of them. I never even knew. I probably thought they lasted one episode. I never heard about him peeing on regularly. <laughs> but fuck, that just shows how bad their fans are, too. You know what? I almost get the feeling with TNA that they they saw that they had like a ground a ground swell, and that's the, they thought. And I think they realized. I think they thought that that's all they needed. You know, like they they had the they had the the groundswell support from the fans, and that was going to carry them into the next level. But they didn't realize that that's just the start. You know, your fans are there, but they want to see you reach that next level. They're willing to help, but you can't rely. You can't put all the pressure of the company on their backs. And I think that's what happened. And their fans backlashed against them. Another thing that I think was a big mistake. And this sort of ties into the idea of um, not knowing what they really want to do with themselves, not knowing what they are and all that. Just in general, stupid ideas. A reverse battle royal? (laughs) Who, like, that is exactly the type of thing you joke about backstage 
And then everybody goes, oh my god, wouldn't that be funny if we just did something that stupid? But <laughs> nobody does. <laughs> and it ends with, yeah, that would be funny, but let's get back to work and do actually some serious <laughs> shit here. Oh yeah, what was that cage match that I mentioned? The one that they had like they built up this like big like menacing cage looking thing and when the matchup actually happened they didn't have enough time to put the cage up so they only had like half a cage set up for the entire matchup it was embarrassing even something as simple as well i shouldn't say as simple but king of the mountain match that's a good name for a match but what the fuck are the rules it's like there's a you paradox. have to pin, you have to pin someone to earn the opportunity to climb the ladder and put the belt up there. Like, what? Like, why is everything got to be the opposite? You're going to have disqualification means that the other person wins? Or, like, uh, you're going to start doing these kind of submission things where you have to tap out to win and you lock yourself in a fucking figure four or something? Like, Oh, that one-legged wrestler won't be able to do that. That's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't have a legged sand on in that match. Uh <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, it is, but it's fucking funny. Um, by, by the way, I did find that matchup. It was the Doomsday Chamber of Blood match. Of course, it's got a name like that. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the Monsters Ball things, and you know, you've got the Lethal Lockdown, which I like the Lockdown pay-per-view idea. The name is fucking great. That's perfect. WWE should have taken that name Lockdown. But why is it that the top lowers down, and then there's a bunch of weapons out there, and every match is, has to be like... Uh, they're just waiting until these like bats and stuff come down, and it, it always came out stupid. Global championship. Why is it the global championship? Because Intercontinental was already taken. Because they already named it Legends, and they ran out of Legends. Yeah, and it's like, why did you name it the Legends Championship to begin with? You don't see the WWE Legends contract people carrying around a title and defending it. And if you really wanted to give it just to Booker T or whatever, then it could have been Booker T's million dollar championship kind of a thing. Not your number two title. Those kind of mistakes are unforgivable in these kind of things. WWE is not immune to doing stupid things. Look at Dylan. But at the same time, almost all of their mistakes are built around them trying to do something that makes some kind of sense. Some people are like, oh, they shouldn't have had two world championships well you know the reason why they had two world championships because they tried to make two different shows that were separated and then they are slowly getting back into where they're going back to what they used to have because they don't have that split anymore are all the tv shows that they do good no but the legends house thing is trying to capitalize off of reality tv shows on a network not on like, let's get a bunch of people to do videos on TNA's website. Which, another thing, too, about the website, for anybody that remembers, there used to be ImpactWrestling.com. And that was not TNA. That was another smart out moment type of website. Kudos to them for figuring out how to jump on that ahead of time and getting paid whatever amount of money they were paid. But that alone, I mean, they didn't register that until a long time after they had started calling it Impact Wrestling. So, huge mistakes there. A couple of good ones, like maybe the six-sided ring was a decent idea to separate themselves a little bit, but you can't operate under the mentality that you want to be WWE, but you don't want to do WWE things, or you want to just copy WWE, or, you know, you gotta, you gotta stand your ground in some way. Um... So, what do you guys think? We should either shit talk some more about random stuff and throw that all out there, or we should do some fantasy booking of different people that should go to WWE. There's not much that we can say that hasn't already been said by a bunch of other people. I mean, we're just kind of we're just kind of going off the cliff notes of you know why TNA sucks. Cliff notes. It sounds like a fucking wrestler that they would have a TNA. Cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> Clifford notes. <laughs> Tony's thinking, man, I need to debut under this character now. <laughs> Cliff notes. I'd come down there and beat your ass, but I don't want to take the time, so I'm just going to give you the rundown version of it. <laughs> <laughs> he could use the bookend, but it could be the notebook <laughs> for his finisher. Look at that. You know, know, hire me real quick. Yeah, at this point, why not? <laughs> 
So, yeah, if you were going to take some people out of TNA and take them out of their misery, so to speak, and put them in WWE, you know, what would you do? I mean, I don't think that a lot of them are really necessarily even worth it. WWE is trying to make sure that they don't spend a whole lot of money on too many things they don't need to. And is there a point in bringing in Rob Terry or Homicide or... Homicide's not even with WWE, uh, TNA. No, oh, there you go. Not even him anymore. Um, uh, even some of the people that used to be in WWE, why bother bringing back Bobby Lashley? Why bother bringing back Mr. Anderson? They're past their prime. They're not going to get the ratings to bump up. And they're probably going to demand a lot more money than what they're worth. There's and only actually, two... There's only two former WWE guys in the entire roster that's worth bringing back, and that's Jeff Hardy and Kurt Angle if they're not on drugs. I don't even think Kurt Angle. I think he's done. Honestly, if they do bring him into WWE, it'll be a, as a trainer. In terms of Hang actual- on, are you telling me you don't want to see a Kurt Angle versus Daniel Bryan match? Because I sure as hell do. If it's just for a one-time thing, then yeah. But I don't think he can get. I don't think he'll be able to pass the physical. I would much rather see Kurt Angle than Jeff Hardy. And I used to really like Jeff Hardy. Why not both? Why not Zoidberg? <laughs> I tell you what, though, if uh, if I were just picking a couple of people, I'd rather have Bully Ray in WWE than Jeff Hardy at this point. I don't think a character like Bully Ray can work because Bully Ray... Bully Ray, he's an abrasive character... And they really don't have that in WWE. I don't think they want a character like that in WWE. You haven't, or else they would have already found somebody like that. Because there are guys like that out there on the independents that could fill the Bully Ray spot. Hell, if you can bring back Devon, just have Bully Ray and Devon help up the tag division. Mm-hmm. If you could get them at a good rate, of course, that's the same. There's a couple other people. I mean, Austin Aries and Rob, uh, Robert Roode, Bobby Roode, whatever he would go by. I still think Ethan Carter the third when he was Derek Bateman, he had a lot of more talent than what they gave him credit for. But man, I don't really even know. Uh, most they of these... need to bring in Spud to uh, manage Rusev. A hey, tight team partner. <laughs> the hot potatoes. <laughs> so I mean, out of any guys that are in TNA right now, what would you guys do with them if you were going to bring them in WWE? I'll just throw that out to anybody who could jump in. I've got three. Three guys off the top of my head. Uh, now, in terms of guys, uh, now nah, you know what? I'm not even gonna bring the. I'm not even gonna say any of the knockouts because I think the only knockout I would honestly see in in um, WWE would probably be ODB, and that's only because I'm a big mark for her. I've always been a fan of hers, and I do think she could probably bring something to there. But I highly doubt they'll ever bring a character like that into there. As far as as far as the actual male wrestlers, I could think of three. One is Bobby Roode. I I really do. I like Bobby Roode, and uh, the reason I like him is because he's one of the few guys that I can honestly say they gave the ball to and he ran with. That summer of Roode, uh, that summer of Roode um, thing that he had a while back, or whatever period he was champion, I really liked. I thought he really came off as a true star. So that's a guy I would love to see brought in. Um, Jeff Hardy, obviously, because I still think that he has the potential to be a big star and. At a time when WWE really is lacking on star power, at least more permanent star power, I think a guy like Jeff Hardy really could bring be that main event draw that I think could get people to actually watch the product. And I'm going to say it right now for the third one. If he can lose the weight, I'd love to see Samoa Joe in WWE. I, I, do th- I, I don't know if they would ever give him a main event spot, but I think a guy like him could really fill up a Dolph Ziggler role. He could be a guy that you could put in there to have solid matches with the guys that you do want to push. I, I I don't know. You know, that's the big anomaly. But given they brought in Kevin Steen, you know, all bets might be off. So for me, it's Rude. It's a uh, Rude, Hardy, and Joe. That's it. What about everybody else here? Anybody that you think should go to TNA or go to WWE from oh, TNA? Oh, TNA. Jeez, it's putting a whole fucking roster in TNA. That's how you save them. <laughs> Um, Shut I'll up, then. Drew. I'll go next then, I guess. Um, guys that I'd want to bring in, if I've only got the choice of three, it's Kurt Angle, Jeff Hardy, and Bobby Roode. Um, Kurt Angle, still a popular name, and I think there's a whole bunch of guys you can have amazing matches with. Him versus Daniel Bryan or Dolph Ziggler, that's hella fun. So, yeah, bring him in. Jeff Hardy, I'm just a mark for the Hardy boys, but more so Jeff, so... 
guilty pleasure. Um, as much as some of the internet have turned on him, I'm still a big Jeff Hardy fan. And Bobby Roode, well, he's just got it, in my opinion. He's a main event star, no matter where he goes. Drew or Payton, anybody that you think should go to WWE? I want Kurt Angle just so he could just squash Rusev and bury him. Like the potato that he is. Yes, make some mashed potatoes instead of baked potatoes. Make some potato chips, why don't we? Why not? Payton? Uh, you guys pretty much named any names that would be worth bringing over. The only other one I might throw in the conversation would be James Storm. He's gotten a bit of a, a gut lately. I think he would have to work on that, and I think he could. I think there's still some time for him. He'll never build himself up to a main event guy, but he's a guy who can come in and flesh out that mid card for a little bit. Other than that, there's there's nothing worthwhile. You're not going to bring over like a Rob Terry or even like uh, who, who's their wannabe Zack Ryder over there? Robbie E. Robbie, Robbie E. You're not going to bring him over. There's not a lot of talent that's really going to benefit WWE too much. A lot of these guys will probably have to try to find jobs either in high school gyms or at their local WalMarts. That's kind of a shame for some of them because somebody like a Robbie E. I mean, he is talented. Uh, no. I, I like Robbie sucks. E. No, he's he's I, not that bad. I think he's fucking terrible. I like some of these other guys. I mean, uh, to an extent, to some of them, some of them not as much as others. Like... Uh, even somebody like Gunner has like more potential than what I had originally thought, but there's just no upside to spending that money in WWE. If they're going to get rid of the people like the Drew McIntyre so that are talented enough that could be made something of, why bring in people that are all the same caliber? Why bring I, I in want... a Jesse Goddard's if uh, there's no role potential in the future? Or even an MVP. MVP's past his prime. Don't spend a whole lot of money on him. Honestly, if I were to add two more names to that, I'd probably add Austin Aries because I, even though they had the chance to bring him in, that that's the reason why I didn't want to put him on my list because they had the opportunity to bring him in and didn't. So I can't really say anything. And, uh... Okay, that's not me. Yeah, that's not me. I'm not making that clicking noise. Um, but, um... It's either Austin Aries or Velvet Sky, just because I'm a mark for her. I, I think, think I... all the knockouts probably can have a much more lucrative career just in modeling, rather than trying to continue to be wrestlers. I don't know. Some of them aren't that bad. I mean, Gail Kim's a great wrestler, but I think she's pretty much burned her... Not so much burned her bridge, but I think... I don't see her going back into there, and... Like I said, I've been a big fan of Angelina Love and Velvet Sky, but I don't know if WWE would bring them, both of them back in. And gun to my head, if I had to choose one, I'd choose Velvet Sky, honestly. So, I think that pretty much everybody has the same assumption when it comes to TNA. And that's sort of what the whole point of this is. It's the beginning of the end. If not, the beginning of the end had already happened before, and this is just kind of the final blow, but... I don't expect to see any positive news coming out of TNA anytime soon. And at most, maybe they get some kind of a deal with like a Yahoo screen or something like that. Maybe Hulu. But that's going to be so significantly low for whatever kind of contracts that they get. They're not going to be able to pay the wrestlers. And, you know, you can't survive on something like that. So... I had the idea of them of WWE maybe bankrolling TNA enough to at least keep the show maybe p and put it on the uh, the WWE network, considering that WWE is kind of lacking in episodic original content. I mean, if if T if Impact Wrestling is up for if, is looking for a place to go, might as well put it on the network. I don't think that they would ever want to have any association with them. I think the TNA name is just so dragged through the mud. There's there's no prestige to that name. There's no benefit of bringing it onto there. I mean, I, I like your idea of having a completely separate product on there. Uh, I, I believe the UFC channel is doing something similar with another company on their version of the WWE Network. I, I think that's fine. Just not TNA. Oh, call it something different. Get a different company. That's cool if you want to do that, but not TNA. That that's that's only going to make the network look less attractive than more attractive. And who's really going to plunk down the 9.99 to watch TNA on a weekly basis anyway? 
Yeah, well, I think me... if you're going to bring in someone else, it's got to be something real different. Maybe like a Japanese or a Mexican promotion, so people are getting a different sense of something. The whole point of UFC bringing in these extra companies, it's like in Victor, it's a women's fighting league, or it's um, a jiu-jitsu tournament. It's something different. Well, let me, let me kind of throw that there to kind of dovetail off of that. Do you guys see any worth in some of the assets that TNA might have up for sale? Like the tape library, the the copyrights, things like that. Do you see that being something that WWE would want to go after, if nothing more than to just have the tape library? Or do you think it's do, who else do you see buying that up, if not WWE? Well, Jeff Jarrett. I could see it just dissolving. Yeah. Just like just like shutting down, Pan Energy goes about their business, investing in better options. I could see Jarrett, maybe picking and choosing some things that he wants. If not, just grabbing a big set of it and just going, okay, guys, uh, Global Force Wrestling is going to incorporate some of the things that you loved from TNA. We're not going to call it TNA. We're not going to do everything, but I really fucking liked this idea that I made, and I like this idea, so I want that back kind of a thing. That's what I would do. The only people yeah. outside of a big company that I could see taking their video library is maybe fucking high spots of all people or someone that can release all that shit and make a profit off it. Is RF Video still around? Who? RF Video. I think they were a video, a wrestling video company. Maybe. I could see that. I could see like maybe a kayfabe commentaries or something. Some like low, some like lower video company maybe getting picking the rights up. Honestly, though, I can't see the rights going for too much. So, I mean, if WWE can shake out maybe like two hundred thousand dollars and plunk it down for the tape library, that is still twelve years of footage that they can put on the network to fill up space. And other than that, they don't have a lot of stuff they could liquidate. I mean, like you said, they don't have their own trucks that actually have any value to them. Nobody's going to want that stupid six-sided ring. This isn't like when WCW went out when there was millions of dollars worth of trucks and ring equipment and lighting equipment and all that that they could pick and choose from. There's just nothing of value left from TNA. I will offer TNA some lint from my pocket and a half-eaten Snickers. All right, TNA, I will one-up you with that. I've got, like, three... Mini Snickers, the little fun size ones. Oh, they could share them. And uh, I think I've got like twice as much lint. And I'll throw in a shiny new penny that I oh. found on the floor earlier today. Oh, hold on, let me check my belly button. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, there's a big clump of lint here. Okay, I could definitely buy TNA. Put that all together, you could easily at least afford Christy Hemi's contract. <laughs> I don't think she would like whatever I would have to do with her with that contract. So, what are my jobs? Insert joke. <laughs> Insert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> know so, what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, in all seriousness, I really do hope somebody picks up the light, the, the tape library. Like I said, I mean, it's it's a part of history, good or bad, and I do think that it somebody should try to make money off of it. And if not WWE, I don't know if Jarrett would want to pick it up just because of how much they burned him. Maybe High Spots might pick it up. Maybe Matthew from Botchamania might. Who knows? <laughs> the best thing that can happen is uh, Jim Cornette picks it up just to fucking put commentary over everything and how fucking retarded it is. <laughs> oh, that's who should buy it. It should be um, World Famous Flea Market. You ever see that channel? <laughs> no. It's like two guys is. do commentary over like really crappy indie shows and they just like <laughs> make fun of them the whole time. So that They should buy TNA's library and they could do that. I'm okay with that. Uh, it's a, con- a consortium between uh, Direct Auto Insurance and uh, Five Hour Energy. <laughs> the only two sponsors that would ever sponsor a TNA event. And so poorly, too. Let's just have yeah. Matt Morgan come out and just be like, I don't know, it's car shit. Like, <laughs> Five Hour and- Energy. It tasted of ass. It was totally suitable for TNA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean... I don't know really what else there is to say about TNA. We've been making fun of them for the longest time, and we're going to continue to make fun of them, even after they're gone, officially. They'll be gone for a while, and we'll just still be like, yeah, you know what else sucked today? I don't know. TNA. Fuck them. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so, uh, tell us what you guys think is going to end up happening with TNA. Try to defend them if you can, too. Uh, you know, if you're a big TNA fan... You think that we're being assholes and, you know, Which we should we give them more credit than 
than we are, then go ahead, chew us out, and you know, see what happens. Uh, but <laughs> that is going to knock us out for all this TNA eulogy kind of stuff. Thank God. We are going to change this over and talk about some Fantasy League talk in the next part, and then that will be it.